Hieronymus Bosch, born Jeroen van Aken in 1450, was a greatly influential artist of the Northern Renaissance. He signed his paintings with the last name Bosch to give some representation to his hometown, Hertogenbosch. Hertogenbosch was, and is, the capital of North Braven province in Holland. People from the Netherlands commonly refer to the town as Den Bosch, which is Dutch for the forest. While Hieronymus lived, Den Bosch flourished as one of the greatest nests of music, culture, art, and commerce in the Netherlands, second only to the sprawling municipality of Utrecht, the religious center of the Netherlands. Bosch was one of many artists of the 16th century who employed a Gothic style influenced by the Black Plague. The bubonic plague appeared in the 14th century and continued to shave away the population of Europe for the next 500 years. The Black Plague inspired many medieval and early Renaissance artists to incorporate more themes of death, hell, famine, and plague into their work. We see this in Bosch's visions of hellscapes crowded with damned souls, while his portrayals of heaven are usually fairly underpopulated. The plague and the Renaissance paved the way for many new schools of thought to gain popularity in Europe. The old feudal system imposed by the church was abolished to make way for new monarchies in the 15th century, although theocracy was still prevalent, granting the church significant political influence. Suddenly, more outlandish and expressive styles of art became palatable to the ruling class. This helped the pessimistic ideology and freakish imagery of Bosch's work to gain traction in the culture of the European Renaissance. Little is known about Bosch's life, and many of the paintings sitting in museums around the world that he is attributed to are mere fragments of the original painting or triptych. The authorship of a few supposed Bosch pieces have been greatly disputed for quite some time. Bosch would occasionally sign his works, which was unusual for artists of his period. Sometimes he would even paint himself into his representations of biblical events. In his work, St. John the Evangelist on Patmos, one can observe a bizarre chimera-like hybrid of a salamander, bird, monkey, and torch sconce with what appears to be Bosch's pale, helmeted, and bespectacled face. His circular, armor-plated abdomen is impaled by a black arrow as he stares dubiously at the sparrow picture to the left. Bosch's early workshop activities and drawings date to a period between 1470 and 1485, although no complete pre-1485 Bosch painting survives to this day. The height of his career occurred during the latter part of his life, around the turn of the 16th century. During this time, he is said to have dabbled in the dark arts of alchemy and sorcery, as you do around the turn of the 16th century. Bosch was a man of taste, and traveled widely outside his native Netherlands. Perhaps this can account for the exotic flora and fauna that appear in the backdrops of his portrayals of saints, as well as his more colorful triptychs. Like most nobles and artists of distinction in Europe at this time, Bosch was a prominent member of the Brotherhood of Mary, where he received many commissions for kings and nobles. While he was advertised as the member of a respectable religious organization such as the Brotherhood, he was also a member of the Adamites, also known as the Brethren of the Free Spirit. The Brethren were a somewhat obscure cult declared heretical by Pope Clement V in the early 14th century. Their doctrine portrayed the Church as an enemy of Christ and stood against hierarchical rule and gender distinction. In spite of this somewhat anti-theistic viewpoint, the cult's beliefs were founded in scriptural justification. This account by author and historian Barbara Tuckman sums up the cult's behavior fairly well. The brethren of the free spirit, who claimed to be in a state of grace without benefit of priest or sacrament, spread not only doctrinal, but civil disorder. Because the free spirit believed God to be in themselves, not in the church, and considered themselves in a state of perfection without sin, they felt free to do all things commonly prohibited to ordinary man. Sex and property headed the list. They practiced free love and adultery, and were accused of indulging in group sex in their communal residences. 
They encourage nudity to demonstrate absence of sin and shame. As holy beggars, the brethren claim the right to use and take whatever they pleased, whether a market woman's chickens or a meal in a tavern without paying. This included the right, because of God's imminence, to kill anyone who forcibly attempt to interfere. Bosch's most well-known and ambitious work, a triptych entitled The Garden of Earthly Delights, can also be interpreted as an example of the Adamite's influence on his work. Many see the central panel that the triptych is named for as a condemnation of humankind's sin, but I feel as though Bosch's participation with the Brethren could confuse that theory. In the first panel, things are relatively peaceful. God is welcoming Adam and Eve to Eden. A unicorn drinks from clear water alongside a herd of neatly lined up equestrian and bovine animals. Fish, birds, an otter, and even a hippocampus dance frantically below God with Adam and Eve. A bizarre pink floral tower pours unidentified liquids into Bosch's vision of a young world. In the second panel, all hell breaks loose. Winged chimeras and angels populate the sky while more freakish pink monuments, now featuring transparent tubing, fleshy veins, and blue rock formations, jut from the flooded landscape in the background. Every part of the painting features some lewd sexual act, sometimes between humans and otherworldly animals, or creatures of Bosch's design. Men and women ride horses and cows around a pool at the center of the painting, carrying oversized fruits cradle in their arms or speared on branches. This seems to be Bosch's abstract perception of the waking world. I would venture to say that the predominantly blue tower in the upper left represents birth, with a crowd of people struggling to exit the threshold. A crowd of people can be seen promptly climbing back into an egg after leaving the structure. In this way, the pink tower to the upper left, with a small amount of people calmly walking down the stream towards its entrance, might represent death or heaven. Many historians contend that the central panel represents the position humanity has in the grand scheme of nature. People go into this pink tower, sometimes hand in hand with a loved one, or alone waving back at their friends and family who either drowned or met a mermaid and then came out of the apparatus, reincarnated as a bird. The third panel is the hellscape. In the bottom right hand corner, people who went to hell because of greed or gambling crowd around a falling table, with cards scattered on the ground. Someone in the crowd is holding up what looks like a backgammon board, while another woman has a dice on her head to further emphasize the judgment of gambling. A pig in a nun's habit weeps in the arms of a scrawny man with a parchment of scripture draped over his leg. This tells us that Bosch believed even virgins and stalwart devotees of Christ could find themselves in hell. An anthropomorphic bird, the Prince of Hell, with a cauldron helmet, shoves damned humans into its mouth before they are secreted from an egg-like gland into a pool of brown faces twisted in agony. The helmeted bird, as well as what most art historians described as the tree man, echoes Hieronymus Bosch's use of vessels combined with animal forms. The triptych is essentially a representation of humanity in chronological order, which is likely the reason Bosch chose to decorate the exterior panels of the trifold with a painting of the earth on the third day of creation, before the introduction of animals and humans. When the triptych opens, we are thrust into Bosch's voyeuristic narrative of human indulgence. The painting was first described by a noble by the name of Antonio di Beatis, who observed the triptych in the Palace of Counts at the House of Nassau in Brussels. From this we can deduce that it was a commission piece. There is still plenty of heavy dispute between art historians about who the original patron was. Bosch's work would go on to be scorned as heresy, in spite of the Gothic artists who echoed his mannerisms in later religious art, endowing the figures of saint and Christ with elongated limbs and undersized heads. No other artist in his time dared to depict biblical narratives in such rich, bizarre detail. In the 20th century, Salvador Dali would draw heavy inspiration from Bosch's fantastical surrealism. 
Today, the work of Hieronymus Bosch is the most unique and intricate representation of religious imagery known to have been produced by any of the great masters. Bosch was one of very few visionaries who was able to realize his vision to such a full extent and in such vibrant, exquisite detail.